When the Scots were oppressed and Scottish fortunes were at their lowest, he was the chief inspiration for their resistance. A man who stood up to the King of England, Edward I, emerging from obscurity to gain a spectacular victory over the English, before enduring a crushing defeat and being put to death in the most barbaric way. A national hero who has gained great admiration, this is the story of Sir William Wallace, one-time guardian of Scotland. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Edward Ruthless and intelligent, King Edward I of England was proving himself to be a highly successful medieval king. The reign of his father, Henry III, had been fraught with instability and military failure. Now, Edward, who ascended to the throne in 1272, was determined to resolve these problems. He was adept at handling the unruly English barons and managed to control them enough that they united behind him. He also used his parliament well, which maintained stability and brought in a constant flow of money, allowing Edward to pursue his goals. But Edward also had a much darker way of raising money. In 1275, he issued a law known as the Statute of Jewry. Money lending was banned by the Catholic Church for any Christian, but Jews were allowed to lend money and act as bankers. This allowed some Jews to become wealthy, which in turn caused hostility and anti-Semitism. Edward persecuted the Jewish population in England by imposing indiscriminate taxation on them. In a way, he was indirectly committing usury himself by encouraging Jews to lend money and then taxing their profits. This money helped to finance his campaigns in both Wales and Scotland. In 1290, Edward expelled the Jews from England completely, and they were made to leave without their money. Now determined to undo his father's failures, and in a foreshadowing of Scottish events, in 1274 Edward raised a large army and invaded Wales. Edward had several castles built across Wales to strengthen his domination, made Wales a provenance of England, and gave the title of Prince of Wales to his eldest son. Having crushed the Welsh, Edward was now at the pinnacle of his power, ruling across the British Isles from east to west. Now he just needed to preserve his lands in France and subdue the Scots. Scotland Scotland is a country with a contentious and troubled identity. As Edward came to the throne, the sense of it being a separate nation was not as well developed as it is today. Then it was an ancient monarchy, but its kings were very much tied to English royalty through marriage. In England, Scotland had vast landholders who had sworn loyalty to English kings, had fought with as well as against the English, and contributed at English councils and parliaments. Politically, the relationship between the two countries was highly ambiguous, and not something that Edward was happy with. He preferred things to be more clear-cut, and he was handed the opportunity to deal with his problem in 1291. Alexander III, King of Scots, died in 1286 after falling from his horse whilst riding in the dark. As he left no surviving children, his heir became his granddaughter Margaret, the Maid of Norway. Determined that she should be married to his son, the Prince of Wales, Edward sent for her. Unfortunately, Margaret died en route to Scotland, probably from food poisoning after her ship landed in Orkney, which was then part of Norway. She was just seven years old. Now the Scottish throne was empty, and as overlord of Scotland, Edward decided that he would choose the next monarch. The Kingmaker. In an attempt to join the two kingdoms of Scotland and England together in 1292, Edward chose John Balliol as ruler, overlooking Robert Bruce and 12 other candidates. Balliol had a decent claim to the throne, as did Bruce, they were both descendants of the Scottish prince, David of Huntingdon. But Balliol was a founder of an Oxford college and a key English landowner, so Edward chose him as the most anglicised applicant. Edward made it clear that he was still in control as sovereign lord, so it didn't really matter who was on the Scottish throne as they would be king in name only. The Scots would remain under English law and would answer to the English courts. This humiliation for Balliol and the authoritarian treatment of the Scots, with heavy taxes and a demand of soldiers to help fight Edward's wars, led to the first Scottish rebellions. Then, Scotland's treaty with England's old enemy France in 1295 brought about a swift retribution from Edward. Furious, he invaded Scotland, first destroying Berwick, where thousands of the town's citizens were massacred, before going further up the coast to Dunbar. There, he met the Scots in battle, 
but they were quickly beaten, and Edward went on to take Edinburgh and Stirling, later boasting that he had conquered Scotland in only 21 weeks. In an echo of what he had done in Wales, Edward made Scotland an un-kingdom, stripping it of its treasures and symbols of national identity. He also stripped Balliol of his position as king, taking the Stone of Destiny and the Scottish Crown Jewels back to England. John Balliol was kept at the Tower of London, but allowed to seek exile in France in 1299. He spent the rest of his life at his ancestral estate in Picardy, northern France. But Edward could ill afford to build expensive castles like he had in Wales to control the Scots, and King Philip IV of France, now in league with the Scots, seized Edward's French lands. Edward had seriously underestimated the Scots, as fierce resistance to the English broke out in Scotland. And now he found himself having to fight on two fronts against both the Scots and the French. William Wallace It is thought that Wallace was born at Elderslie, Renfrewshire, Scotland in 1270, although little is actually known about his family history. He may have been the son of Sir Malcolm of Elderslie. What is known is that his childhood was spent during the reign of the Scottish King, Alexander III, which was a period of economic stability and peace for the country. As unhappy as the rest of his fellow Scots with the English invasion in May 1297, Wallace led a group of 30 men to the Scottish town of Lanark, where they killed the English High Sheriff, William de Hesselring. He then joined Sir William the Hardy, Lord of Douglas, to march on Scone and attack the English forts between the rivers Tay and Forth. Simultaneously, several other rebellions were occurring in Scotland, led by another revolutionary called Andrew Murray. The two joined forces and together, on the morning of September the 11th of 1297, with their Scottish army, they faced the English, near Stirling, led by the Earl of Surrey. The Scots were heavily outnumbered, the English having 3,000 cavalry and over 8,000 infantrymen. But Wallace came up with a plan. Stirling Bridge was so narrow that only a few men could cross at the same time. As the English came across, the Scottish army held back to lull them in. But as soon as the second half began crossing, the Scots attacked quickly, killing them. Almost all the English who had crossed were either killed or drowned in the river. Surrey managed to escape south, and for Wallace, Murray, and Scotland, it was a resounding victory. However, Murray was wounded on the battlefield and later died from his injuries. Wallace continued his campaign and led an invasion into the north of England, ravaging the counties of Cumberland and Northumberland, burning the town of Annick, and laying siege to Carlisle. Although he was merciful to the monks of Hexham, granting them protection, he was also known for his cruelty towards the English, supposedly flaying one soldier and keeping his skin as a trophy. In early December 1297, Wallace returned to his homeland, was knighted there, and given the title of Guardian of Scotland. The ceremony was carried out at the Kirk of the Forest, Kirk being the Scottish word for church. Then Wallace set himself up in the name of King John Balliol, who was still a prisoner at the Tower of London, and with support from the Bishop of Glasgow, Sir John Graham of Dundraff, Sir John Stuart, Robert the Bruce, and other Scottish nobles, he began to organise the army and take control of the country's affairs. Although many other nobles had English estates and were held hostage by Edward, so they hedged their bets waiting to see if Wallace would be successful on the field of battle. Falkirk. It was Edward himself who arrived and crossed the River Tweed on July the 3rd, advancing towards Stirling. He brought a large army of archers and cavalry backed up with Irish and Welsh mercenaries. Wallace began a slow retreat, but destroyed the country on his way north, stopping Edward's men from replenishing supplies. With both morale and provisions low, and mutiny in the ranks, Edward was about to return to Edinburgh when intelligence reached him that the Scots were camped nearby, at Falkirk. Edward advanced to find Wallace and his men on sloping ground with a river as protection. The English had at least 15,000 men, and the Scots less than half of that number. The English had difficulty crossing the river and the nearby boggy ground, but they had the Welsh longbowmen who fought aggressively against Wallace's spearmen, breaking their ranks. And although the Scots were still able to exact many casualties on the English cavalry, they were defeated with the loss of Wallace's second-in-command, Sir John de Graham. Although Wallace escaped with his life, his military reputation was in tatters. He resigned his guardianship of Scotland in December 1298 in favourite of Robert the Bruce, Earl of Carrick, who would later become the Scottish King, and John Common, who was the nephew of the previous King, John Balliol. 
For the next few years, the details of Wallace's whereabouts are obscure. It has been suggested that he sought support from King Philip IV in France for the Scottish cause. During this time, Edward relentlessly sought to apprehend Wallace. Capture and Death on the 5th of August 1305, Wallace was arrested by Sir John de Menteith, a Scottish knight who was loyal to Edward. He was taken to London and Westminster Hall, where he was tried for war crimes and treason. The charges being that he had killed indiscriminately, quote, sparing neither age nor sex, monk nor nun. He was crowned with an oak garland as King of Outlaws. There was no trial because of the charge of treason to the king. Wallace denied this charge, stating that, quote, I could not be a traitor to Edward, for I was never his subject. He was sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered, which if you'd like to know more about, you can check out our video on this channel. On the 23rd of August, 1305, Wallace was stripped naked and dragged on a hurdle six miles through the streets of London to Smithfield. Spectators pelted him with excrement and attacked him with sticks and whips. After being strung up for a mock hanging, he was cut down and secured. The executioner then sliced off his genitals and cut out his intestines before burning them on a brazier in front of him. After the disemboweling, Wallace's heart was ripped from his chest and held up to the crowd for everyone to see before he was beheaded and quartered. His limbs were sent north to be displayed at Berwick, Perth, Newcastle, and Stirling, whilst his head was put on a spike at London Bridge. Freedom. Robert the Bruce finally won independence for Scotland, and Edward I, who was the country's greatest enemy, became known as the Hammer of the Scots. It was Wallace that became the physical embodiment of Scotland's fight for freedom, a warrior, a leader, and a representation of its people. He is honoured by over 20 monuments in his beloved Scotland, including the most famous one at Stirling. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe as we release videos every Friday. Cheers.